Welcome everybody at this FT Masterclass in Strategic Innovation. I just checked my kind of my emails from a couple of years ago and I uh, remind myself that we started in 2012 with the first FT Masterclass in Strategic Innovation and the idea at that time was pretty much the same as as today to send the message that innovation is not just about changes in technologies but also uh, usually these changes in technologies, uh, technology are accompanied with changes in organizational structure, changes in business models, uh, changes in strategy, and this actually require a particular type of an engineer, a particular type of a manager who can actually manage, uh, uh, manage novelty. And we have today a speaker who can definitely talk about these things, about this uh, complexity of innovation. So today with us is Rashik Parmar from, from, from IBM. I've learned today that Rashik is a little bit in between, not quite jobs, but in between roles. So uh, he will lead a new, uh, new department in, in, in IBM in the near future, so he might tell you a little bit about this. Uh, he used to be the president of IBM Technology uh, Academy and he is now its uh, IBM distinguished, distinguished engineer. Uh, he has also recently published a paper in Harvard Business Review. Uh, so something that, I mean, we uh, academics here at this school would be pretty uh, happy to have a paper in Harvard Business Review, so that's well done. Uh, uh, so, uh, and he will probably talk a little bit about how companies try to be systemic uh, with innovating and what are the different patterns the companies actually can use to innovate, especially on the basis of changes uh, or advances in digital technologies. So, Rashik, uh, please, the floor is yours. Thanks, Christo, and uh, good evening. So, great to see you all here. You've given up your evening to listen to me, so it's, uh, it's, a, it's a great pleasure for me. Um, and the, the thing I ask of you is, um, let's make this interactive. The last thing I want to do is just to have to preach to you, because quite frankly, I could have recorded a video of this otherwise. So please challenge me, please ask questions as we go through. Um, and what I thought I'd title the discussion of is um, in search of new value. Because fundamentally, innovation is about trying to find new forms of value, ways in which what you have is of some value to somebody else out there and creates value capture in, in new, new mechanisms. And so to start to explore this, let's just wind the clock back and, and ask ourselves, how has innovation actually taken place and how has that changed people's lives? And, and this, this slide really sort of summarizes for me some of the essence of innovation over the last couple of hundred years. And you, you know, if I go back and look at what my forefathers did, well, for them, value was growing crops in a field. Right, growing foods of different types and then selling them in the marketplace was how they made money. And when I go back to India and go and see some of my, my relatives, that, that's, that for them is still value. Having the land was, was, was fundamental value for them. Um, but then we had this thing called the Industrial Revolution that meant machinery, mechanization in the form of machinery replaced many of those jobs. And value moved from growing the food to manufacturing the machines that would allow the replacement of different forms of labor. And, and that really changed the landscape of work, changed the landscape of, of, of value for, for quite a significant number of folk. And then in the early 60s, we saw the invention of uh, IT, computing. And, and on the left hand, on, on your left hand side there, there's a, the, the brown image is actually an image of a bank. And this is typical of the halls inside banks where people ran accounting. And you would have accountants, clerical workers who would keep books, account books of banking information. And their world was disrupted by the thing on the right side, which is computers. Uh, and largely that replaced a large chunk of labor in the early 60s, 70s, and, and, and so on. And right now what we're seeing is the innovation in mobile devices is starting to replace a new form of role. So the roles on the bottom left hand side, you, know, you go around walking through these call centers where there's cubicles, you know, th these halls full of people sat in these little cubicles answering phone calls. Um, gradually, people don't want to talk to somebody on the phone there, they want to actually use an app. And so these are, these are all examples of, of kind of innovation that has really changed 
our lives in ways that we, we couldn't imagine prior to that. And then after the innovation's taken place, we, we can't imagine being without them. Um, and, and so as you start to think forward about how innovation starts to change landscapes and industries, um, a piece of work that I really like, which was published last year, was uh, Peter Marsh's work on the new industrial revolution. And I don't know how many of you have seen this piece of work or have read this. Um, but he starts to portray this, this evolution and, and starts to discuss some of the topics which are quite interesting. And, and some, of the, some of the points that he makes about hybridized manufacturing and the notion of, of how value chains start to emerge around um, some core ecosystems are kind of fundamental to where we see the role of cities and the, the economic powerhouses of driven countries of, of the future. So it's a very nice piece of work, very well presented, very clear. Um, but he finishes off by starting to pose the question of when we start to look at digitization and what digiti digitization does to innovation, one of the fundamental attributes of digitization is if I take something and automate it, I, I fundamentally remove value from that thing that was there before. Right? I, in essence, replace value in, in the form of labor, of, of in, in the form of knowledge or expertise with some form of technology, and value has to move somewhere else. Knowledge and experience has to move somewhere else. A and there, I've come across a piece of work from a chap called Nick Lovell. Any of you seen Nick Lovell's work? Any of you heard of you guys got to get out some more. Where have you been? <laughs> I thought it was in an academic issue. You're supposed to know these things, right? So, so Nick, Nick talks about the curve. And, and his fundamental question is, how do you make money when things are going free? Right? Because if digitization drives us towards free, we have to make money in a world that moves more and more towards free. So rather than me answering that, let, let's get Nick to talk a bit about this. How do you make money when everything is going free? If you make music or games, books or television, you've been struggling with this for years. But what about those of you who make swimming pools or flour or manufacture lemon squeezers in China? Free is coming to you too, as digital printing and 3D manufacturing brings casual piracy to the world of physical products. Are you scared yet? You should be excited too. Because the thing that is destroying the value of everything you hold dear is also giving you an unprecedented chance to build your business or to finance the creation of your art. To understand that, you need to understand the curve. The curve is a new way of seeing the world that shows us not to be afraid of giving some things away for free. Your customers and fans are getting things for free, legally or illegally, anyway. And this is your opportunity. Because the web allows you to build one-to-one -one relationships with those customers and fans. It allows newcomers to experience what you do for free, while allowing your biggest supporters to spend lots of money on things they truly value. And as customers and fans ourselves, the curve shows us how our relationship with the artists, creators and companies we love is about to change, allowing us to focus on the things that we really value. The curve comes in three parts. Use free to find an audience, Use technology to figure out what that audience values and to move them along the curve from freeloaders to superfans. And let your biggest fans spend lots of money, and I do mean lots, on things they really value. The curve solves the pressing problem of the digital age, how to make money when everything is tending towards free. I'm Nicholas Lovell. Join me to explore the curve. What, what Nicholas does in this in this book is start to portray a set of case studies of how people have understood in the, the today's age, you have to give some things away for free. And by giving those things away for free, you get the opportunity to really get something back. And, and you look at Google as a, as a way of doing that. We go and search on Google to go and find things. Those searches create new ideas for products and services, and they then turn that into value. Right? So they, it kind of pr portrays a lot of the the underlying business models for how we start to make money in this new era that we're moving into, this, this new digital era. Um, and, and as you start to think through that, you start to realize actually corporations, traditional corporations, 
have got a huge challenge because in essence, startups, small businesses are able to, to, to really um, destroy their marketplace and capture value in ways that they couldn't imagine themselves. And so as a corporate, you need to start to think about what is your level of ambition in, in innovation? What am I gonna try and do to protect my relationship with customers, protect the value that I have, or in fact, I create new value? And so this chart starts to, st to talk about some of the core strategies and in my discussions with, with senior leaders in business, one of the things I have to very quickly understand is what's their appetite for innovation? Because not everybody's in a position to be able to innovate. And until you can understand that, you can't engage in this dialogue of, of, of innovation in, in the marketplace. And often as a manager, you're faced with this challenge of delivering today's revenues and at the same time destroying your current business to create a complete new set of revenues. And so the right hand side starts to talk about how you apply technology. So you, you're trying to do things which drives a set of activities which identifies ideas for innovation. There may be core innovation ideas, there may be simple things that are driving adjacent innovation, or there may be more fundamental ideas which are completely transformational. So you have to place some bets on how you're gonna invest in innovation. At the same time, you've gotta watch very carefully how technology is destroying what you had. Because if automation takes hold in places that you hadn't thought about, all of a sudden your value, which is seen as, as a big value, suddenly disappears. So understanding these two, two aspects of innovation are kind of fundamental to success. And that leads into the work that I've, I've led over the last four or five years, which was published in the Harvard Business Review. I don't know if any of you have seen the paper that I published, but there's a, there was some fundamental thinking that, that led us to this. And the exam question that we started with was, how does technology not disrupt a business, but how does it disrupt an industry? And how do we understand at the industry level how innovation is taking place? So we're trying to step away from the, the corporation and the, the firms to start to look at innovation from a helicopter view and then use that to inform the strategies that, that organizations take, take place. Um, and, and so we, we unearthed effectively these five patterns and, and the paper kind of describes these patterns quite clearly. Um, and what I'd like to do is just to, to give you a, a small cameo of each one of them so you get a feel for how these, these patterns are relevant in, in the world that we live in. So the first pattern says, anything that's a product, a physical product that leaves the manufacturing gates, in today's world, or in yesterday's world, the manufacturer lost contact with that product. The point at which they, they did all the work on the product was up until it left the factory gates. At that point, they lost contact. But what's happening with different forms of technology, I can now put sensors, and I can, I can put connectivity into my product. So no longer is that product just something that leaves my factory gates. It's something I can stay connected with. And our ability to stay connected with those products creates a fundamental set of opportunities for innovation. Okay. So let's take the classic example here, and the classic example is Rolls-Royce. Right? Rolls-Royce no longer sells aero engines, it sells power by the hour. They sell a, a, a committed number of flight hours and a performance per engine. And they do that because they have a thousand sensors in every single engine, and in Derby, they're monitoring every single engine that's flying the skies. They know which part needs to be repaired at what moment in time, and they're managing the, the logistics and, and supply chain to make sure the right engineer is at the right airport at the right moment in time to keep the engine flying. Because if it stops flying, then they lose money. So that's the first part. And, and you can start to see many, many examples of how you know, automation, uh, sensors and connectivity inside products allows us to transform those products. You see that in the cameras that you have. The cameras are no longer standalone cameras, they now have Wi-Fi in there, you can start to publish on, on, the, on, the, on the things. We haven't got to the point where things like glasses are, you know, the, the glass is, is, is automated. But I was looking very recently at some, some technologies which allows the wine glass to be automated so the person holding the glass you'd know whether they're getting drunk or not, whether they should be drinking that, that wine or not, right? Th these, are these are ideas of, of how innovation could transform that product experience, and that's the first example, right? The second example says, or so the second pattern says, <clears throat> anything in the service industry um, is effectively manpower-driven. 
And as you start to dissect the service industry, you find three categories of service. Creative services, routine services, and personal services. That's, that's how Friedman kind of describes it. Um, and others have talked about it in different ways. And each of those are going through different forms of change. And the net of it is the ability to digitize the service that's provided and then offer that service virtually in the cloud creates both a massive disruptive force but a massive opportunity. Right. And so the, the, th the second pattern says being able to aggressively automate the manual aspects of your, your business and make that available not just for yourself but for the whole industry is the way in which we drive innovation, drive value. Uh, and there's many examples in my, my own company, IBM. We, we, for example, have aggressively replaced our HR systems with, with cloud-based HR services, which we now offer to others. So, so that's one example. Uh, expenses system, all the kind of admin things, business services, are gradually being replaced and done through the cloud. Um, even at the, the extent of, if I want to have a book design today, I can do that on the cloud without actually going and meeting anybody. It's just on the, on the web. Right? So that's, that's pattern two. Pattern three is a bit more abstract, but actually very, very important. Pattern three says there are value chains in the industry which span multiple organizational boundaries. And those organizational boundaries create inefficiencies. And the inefficiencies exist through legal structures, a whole bunch of inefficiencies. Right? And as you start to extract out the information across that value chain, consolidate it into one place, you start to see the opportunity for optimization of the value chain. Take the wastage out of that process and create new value. And the, and the ultimate example of that is smarter cities. So the idea of a smarter city is one where you know, the, the journey from your home to the university today is a, is a complex journey. It goes through many, many processes probably. But, but actually it shouldn't be. It's because we've got different service providers the car parking provider is separate from the person that runs your vehicle, your, your car maintenance, which is different from the bus company, which, and, and all these, these things are separate. By bringing the information together, we can start to optimize journeys as an example. Right? So that's, that's an example of, of pattern, and again, many, many of those. Pattern four says any organization captures information about their business in some form. That information, that data, is of value to adjacent organizations and our ability to trade that information creates a new value opportunity for us. Right? So a best example here is Vodafone. Right? Vodafone captures information on mobile phone trajectory and speed. Right? They aggregate that and sell that as high resolution traffic data to TomTom. That's an example, that's an adjacent business. And the final pattern says, digital representations of physical assets creates new interaction patterns. And those new interaction patterns can create new value. Right, we've seen that with books. So digital books, digital music, digital videos, right, they create completely new interaction patterns. So the cost of distribution of a CD suddenly was decimated because we could create a digital version of the CD. Right? Now, as we start to move into 3D printing, this pattern takes off in, in a very different way. So the manufacturing processes that we've, we've had in the past are gonna go through tremendous change because of that, that fifth pattern. So they're the five patterns that we think are fundamental patterns for how industries will get transformed over the coming probably couple of decades. Right? Now, I've been challenging people to say, are those the only five or there, is there a sixth pattern or a seventh pattern? And nobody's come up with one yet, so I hope one of you guys comes up with one. Right? So let me just start to peel this back a bit more and say, well, okay, wh why are we in this way? I mean, this, this is a, in some ways very exciting, some, some ways very scary. Why are we in this world? And, and it, it comes back to a, a number of aspects of, of the daily business that we have. So the, the businesses that survive in this, this world going forward are ones that can firstly think through some of the characteristics. So if I'm in, a, in, a, in an ecosystem, in a value chain, I need to understand where my adjacent value is. I, I can't just focus on my current and here and now, because if I do, then something's gonna come and hit me elsewhere. So, so the ones that are surviving are able to do the adjacency. And in that, in that competitive landscape, I need to have a value proposition which protect, it has some kind of core control point which protects my value. So this notion of differentiation is key. 
also in this marketplace, scale is fundamental. Right? Scale is one of the biggest control points that exists, and you can only scale through ecosystems. So your ability as an enterprise to be able to have an ecosystem that works with you and be able to capture value through that ecosystem through partners is kind of fundamental. And the last part is your operating model has got to be dynamic so it can go both upwards and downwards. Right? And, and again, as we went through the work um, consolidating all the various case studies into those, those patterns, these four attributes of the, the organizations that are able to survive kind of stood out as, as key. But as you start to think through what's going on here, there is kind of underlying evolution of platforms. This notion of business platform is one that we haven't really explored enough. Um, and, and, and Annabelle Gower and Michael Cusmano, two of, who've been doing a lot of work in that space, so Annabelle in, in Imperial and Michael at, over at MIT, both of whom I've worked with over, over, the, over the years, they, they both started to grasp this notion of platform. And we've understood platform in the manufacturing sense. So in the, in the car space, we understand platform as the chassis of a car or a, a piece part in, in a mobile phone structure. But platform in this new business world is something that we haven't really thought through. And, and what we start to understand is value that's derived from the platform can, can be, be delivered internally or more globally. But the ability to standardize that platform and become the organization that owns and controls the standard is kind of the, the holy grail for a lot of these things. And, and, and going back to Peter Marsh's work, when he talks about um, some of the new ecosystems that are emerging, each of those have a set of underlying platforms. He doesn't talk about them platform, as platforms, but they're very clearly underlying platforms because those platforms derive the whole ecosystem and, su and sustain the whole ecosystem. So, so platform strategy becomes one of the, the key skills that, that managers need to have in, in, the, in the world that we go, go forward with. So I kind of net this out as, as four fundamental skills or capabilities that a manager needs to have. So as you, as you start to think through this, you know, going back to the manager, the first thing that a manager has, to go, has got to try and think through is how do I create compelling ideas for value which which allows innovation in adjacency or innovation that matters to us. And then I've got to start to think through what is the potential for this to be a platform? Is there a potential platform out of these ideas? Because if they are, then I can scale it and kind of start to think through those things. And then I've got to start thinking about how do I create the right kind of business model that I can actually make money out of this? Because right? we, you know, we, we all like to do things that are interesting, but ultimately we're in, in this game to create money, some kind of value in terms, in terms of money. And then the last part is speed. Right. So once you've got the first three things thought through, once that idea is gelled, you can't wait for the marketplace to catch up with you. You've got to go at a speed. And, and so the managers that are able to handle these kind of four very different aspects are the ones that seem to be succeeding the, in, the, in the work that we've done so far. So let me go back now and say, okay, that's, that's all very interesting, but what is it that's really driving this fundamental change? How did we get into this, this, this world where we've got to go at this kind of pace? And um, this particular thing is, is, a, is, is the technology that's driving this change. Now, here's a, a quiz for you. So to force some participation, anybody know what this is? Every one of you is dependent on it today in some way or form. Come on, somebody must know. Surely. Clock? clock? <laughs> no, no, it's a bit more fundamental than that. A battery? Battery, no. Getting closer. Microprocessor. Transistor. Who said transistor? Yes, that's actually the first transistor. Right, uh, any idea when it was invented? So first transistor, invented in 1947, Bell Labs in, in New Jersey. Um, and that really revolutionized IT. That, that really made it possible for us to create computers and silicon and so on. Okay, so next exam question. How many transistors are there in the world? Okay, I'll make it easy for you. Plus or minus a million is good enough, okay? Hmm. Seven billion. Seven billion, okay. So anybody, adv any advances on seven billion? Should be much higher than that. Yeah. yeah. 
much higher, yes. Okay, how many transistors to every human alive? I'll make it even easier for you now. Roughly for a person, how many transistors does, does a human have today? Roughly? 20. 20. I think it depends on what technologies he's using. Yeah. So let's take an average. Let's take an average. So, uh, any, any idea how many transistors sit in your little um, tablet there? <laughs> Maybe around 30? No? So try 24 million. <laughs> Roughly, plus or minus a bit. <laughs> okay, so uh, so when, we, when we did the calculation back in 2010, there were a billion transistors to every human alive. That was 2010, right? At 2005, we were manufacturing more transistors than we grew grains of rice every year. Right? By 2012, if we wanted, we could actually develop sensors that could censor every single grain of rice and monitor its path through its life. Right? So that's what technology is today. So start to think through where this technology is taking us, right? So we've been through the tabulating era of technologies which allowed us to manage paper, manage sequencing of paper through sensors and so on. Uh, we've come through this era of programmable systems. So we're all familiar with mobiles and computers and you know, I, I, I expect to go to a cash machine and put my card in and expect it to give me cash. It's just, it's just the way life is, right? That's kind of our expectation. That's only possible because these microprocessors through these transistors have made that possible. But let's now think a little bit forward. What's, what's, what's technology going to do in the next 20, 30, 40, 50 years? Um, and this gets quite interesting and can be scary as well. So let's, let's, let's start to think through this. And, and we start to discuss this as cognitive computing. We've been very careful in choosing the term cognitive computing, not artificial intelligence. Because right? we're not trying to create artificial intelligence, we try to mimic the way the brain works and apply that into algorithms. So up till now, computing has been dependent on programmers to go and sit and write programs. Right? We're about to move into a world where we're going to give computers access or algorithms access to large volumes of information in the form of corpuses of data and pattern matching systems are going to start to make sense of that and help us understand that. Because right now, as a human, we're not able to cope with the phenomenal amount of data that's coming at us. So next exam question, how much data is in the world today? We got, you've got to know these things, right? Sorry? What measurement are you looking for? Bytes. 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 How many? OK. So, so the average Formula One car, as it goes around a, a, a lap of a, of a circuit in its, its racing car, in its, in its race, is throwing off 30 megabytes of data. Right? 30 million bytes of data is being thrown off. Every Formula One car as it goes around one circuit. In the world, there are 20 exabytes of data. Anybody know, not, who doesn't know what exabytes are, 10 to the 23. That's how much data is actually in the world today, and it's doubling every 18, 18 months, roughly. Right. So it's, its ability of these kind of systems to start to make sense of those kind of volumes of data, that's really driving a lot of the next set of innovations. And it's hard for us to get our head around that. So, so how, do, how do we start to understand that? So let's start to think about how computers start to augment our senses. So these are examples of how some of these cognitive algorithms are starting to change things. Let's take the simple one, which is, which is smell. Yes, it's possible for you to attach a nose to your computer. Right? There are technologies to do that. There's a, there's a set of nano cantilevers which are attached to silicon, and as the molecules of, of um, odors go past that, different cantilevers move, and those cantilevers can tell the chips what, what kind of odors they are. Right? So that, that's possible. And why, why are we using that? So we're using that to put sensors inside crates of food today to be able to monitor whether that food is going off or not because they give out a sense that smells. We're also exploring can, can we use sensors to smell the odors that humans give off to try and understand what diseases they might have because, again, we create different odors. Right? So these are examples of, of how smell is being used. And it's those pre-programmed algorithms that allow us to then 
understand the patterns of information coming through those senses. So we're really mimicking what the nose does. Right? Let's look at taste. Yes, we could put a tongue on the computer if we wanted, but we're not doing that right now. So what we're looking at is how do we create recipes of food that taste good, satisfy us, but are also good for us? Uh, and this is a, a piece of work we call Watson Chef, and we showed it at South by Southwest earlier this year. And it's surprising how we can mimic the, the kind of taste of individual you know, ethnic um, tastes and yet create recipes that, that, that hadn't been thought about by understanding the nutritional value uh, and the implications on how the, the tongue relates to those and how, again, partly the smell works to, to recreate the right kind of recipes. And some of the recipes that I've had, by the way, I've been to, to, to dinners uh, where Watson has created the whole menu and, and quite frankly, I was thinking this is going to taste awful, but it actually tastes pretty good. So that's, that's, um, that's taste. Um, let's look at hearing. So hearing is one of my favorite projects, a very good, uh, you know, great researcher, friend of ours. Um, he's, he's actually deaf and, and what he's trying to use these algorithms, these cognitive algorithms to do is to be able to understand uh, why his baby's crying. Now, all the mothers out there, you will know this, that when your baby's crying, you know exactly why it's crying. As males, we don't have a clue. Right? We have absolutely no idea. Right? So, so what he's done is he's taken the baby's cry and he's used the pattern matching algorithms to understand what the, the under, underlying aspects of that, that cry is. And he can now tell you whether his baby's crying because it's pooped itself, it's hungry, it's tired, it wants to sleep. You know. And there's a whole bunch, he's got a, a repertoire about 20 different reasons why it might be crying that's coming up because of the algorithm being able to understand that and being able to replicate those things. And again, we're using those to start to do all kinds of things. Like for example, you know, in this room, when the wind blows and the doors start moving, we, we kind of ignore that. Computers can't do that, right? Computers today can't do that. What we're starting to do is use these algorithms, these learning algorithms, to be able to recognize the sound signature for different things and be able to recognize the imp impact of that. Um, what we're doing with sight is, for example, putting security cameras which are monitoring car parks. And the car parks, they're monitoring the, the path of vehicles going through that car park. And it knows what are accepted paths. Once you get a vehicle doing something that it shouldn't be doing, so an unexpected path, it starts to flag things up. Right? Um, and this is being used in the Mistering case. Are you familiar with Mistering? Do you understand Mistering is in retailing? Or Sweethearting, as it's called now? Um, so Sweethearting is where uh, you go, granny goes to the checkout and um, the person at the checkout operator, because it's granny, she's going to let them take some things without necessarily paying for them all. Right? So they scan some items and don't scan other items. Effectively stealing, but, but it doesn't look like it because as far as anybody's looking at it, the, the checkout operator has scanned everything. Right? There's so many beeps going on, nobody knows whether they actually beeped or not. As far as it's concerned, it's beeped. Right? Um, so we're using cameras to monitor the checkout operators and see the action of the scan and then taking information from the checkout itself to see whether a barcode was scanned or not. And if it wasn't scanned, then it flagged that up as a poten potential uh, sweethearting and pick those. So it's another example. So, so these, are, these are real commercial examples of how this, this stuff has, has impact. Right? Um, the last one is my favorite, which is touch. And touch is, is something that we don't often think about. When you, when you look at an image on, on your mobile phone, <coughs> It's just an image, it's just a piece of glass. Well, what we can start to do with these, some of this kind of technology is to effectively make the image on the glass, the, the feel of the image on the glass real. So if you, if you imagine on the, on the glass was a, a piece of silk, as you ran your finger over, over that piece of glass, the haptic feedback and electrostatic feedback will make it feel like if it was a silk. If it was wool, it would feel like the wool, right? So effectively being able to touch through the glass. So some of the things that these, these algorithms can do. And by, by the way, that's, that's live in the lab. So it's, when, you, when you see this, it's, it's very creepy. <laughs> but, but it's there. Right? So that gives you some kind of feel for how this cognitive capability starts to change things. Well, let me give you another example. And, and this is uh, a thing called Watson Debater. So you, you, you're, I hope you're all familiar with Watson, which was a couple of years ago, played the game of Jeopardy. Um, and the exam question of, well, from, from our head of research was, can you build a computer which can play the general knowledge quiz show game of Jeopardy and win beating the world champions? Some of these world champions, Ken and Brad, both had won millions of, of dollars in, in this game of Jeopardy. So 
So they just specialize in, in understanding this general knowledge bit and respond to that. Uh, and uh, and the, the, the Watson computer actually won the game of Jeopardy and sort of kind of you know, push forward computing knowledge in that way. But the next question that we're trying to look at is, can you take a corpus of knowledge and apply these algorithms to give you some insight into that knowledge itself? So if we were to say, take Wikipedia today and ask Wikipedia, should the sale of video games to binders be banned? Right. So that's a, that's a question. So an MBA might be asked to do, the, do that piece of research. They may spend a fair amount of time doing that research and coming to an answer. Well, let's see what these algorithms might do for that. Hello, and welcome to the IBM Debating Technologies demonstration. Today we shall focus on detecting relevant claims. To proceed, please select the topic, and I will share with you my top predictions for pro claims and con claims. Scanned approximately 4 million Wikipedia articles. Returning 10 most relevant articles. Scanned all 3,000 sentences in top 10 articles. Detected sentences which contain candidate claims. Identified borders of candidate claims. Assessed pro and con polarity of candidate claims. Constructed demo speech with top claim predictions. Ready to deliver. You have selected the topic. The sale of violent video games to minors should be banned. I would like to raise the following points in support of the topic. Exposure to violent video games results in increased physiological arousal, aggression-related thoughts and feelings as well as decreased prosocial behavior. In addition, these violent games or lyrics actually cause adolescents to commit acts of real-life aggression. Finally, violent video games can increase children's aggression. On the other hand, I would like to note the following claims that oppose the topic. Violence in video games is not causally linked with aggressive tendencies. In addition, most children who play violent games do not have problems. Finally, video game play is part of an adolescent boy's normal social setting. Would you like to discuss another topic? Okay, so for those who didn't quite understand what was going on there, when the thing started, it takes it about four seconds to scan the four million Wikipedia articles and actually understand, the, uh, identify the articles that are relevant to the question you're asking. Once it picks out those articles, it then can not just scan the article for words, but it actually scans for the meaning of what the, the particular question has. So it's got a level of understanding of the documents themselves, and it picks out the documents that are not just relevant, but have appropriate uh, points to make. It picks out the points within the, so it goes through the paragraphs and the sentences, picks out those that are making powerful statements. It looks at the provenance of those statements. So where does that statement come from? What's the reference around that? And how often is it, is it referred to in other articles? So the importance of those pieces. From those, it's then understanding the positive and negative nature of those against that particular statement. And then it picks out the top five and gives you the plus or minuses. And that ticket takes about four seconds. Right. Now that set of technology all of a sudden gives you a level of innovation which you might not have thought about, right? But actually, this isn't about technology. This is about innovation, it's about people. Right? Because ultimately, it's about what matters to people. And value and innovation, unless it's creating value to an individual somewhere, it's not gonna be of, of real real importance. It's not going to be of sustaining importance. And, and so we've got to really go back and understand what is it that people really care about, what it really matters to individuals. Um, and and this, this set of images really sort of summarizes it for me. You know, when you go into a movie and you go and watch, say, the 2012 or the day after tomorrow, and you put your 3D glasses on and, you know, the water's lapping over New York, you feel you're absolutely there. It feels real, right? And at the same time, we're seeing floods in Brisbane or we're seeing earthquakes in different parts of like Tokyo or whatever. And we've started to become numb to some of these societal issues that are out there. Um, we're seeing riots, we're seeing uh, you know, all of these you know, societal challenges, which really should be things that we should be really aware of and frightened of. We've become numb to them because ultimately the technology has made it so normal that we're seeing this kind of violence, this kind of stuff that's just, just kind of normal to us. And so one of the challenges that we have is, is how do we make that relevant? 
how do we start to understand some of the real fundamental issues that matter to us as humankind? And, and you take any one of those that, that I've got there, but let me take my favorite topic, right, which is apples. Right? Um, if you go to the average supermarket shelf and you pick up an apple in the UK, it will have traveled 3,700 miles on average. Right? You probably haven't even thought about that, but, but 3,700 miles, when that apple could have been grown 50 miles away. Right? Let's go to the, just stop across the US. The average carrot in the US travels 1,400 miles. Um, it passes itself three times on the journey from the farm to the supermarket shelf. Half of those carrots will never actually get to the, to the, the uh, supermarket shelf. If I go back to 1950, it would cost us one jewel to grow that carrot. Today, it costs us 10 jewels for that same carrot. Right? And that's progress. And we've got to ask ourselves, is that sustainable? Is that appropriate in the world going forward? Right? And so some of these societal issues become the ways in which we drive innovation. So the reason I'm trying to portray this is understanding human need at a society level creates the opportunity for us to drive innovation and create value, which, which is not just for the here and now, but it's for the longer term. And they become quite big topics. So this notion of smarter cities, and Leeds is one of those regions that wants to become a smarter city. Um, and I sit on the LEP board and we're driving a lot of the activities around that. There are some fundamental issues. You know, how do we cope with the aging population? How do we create safe and vibrant communities? How do we create jobs that matter in the region? All of these are drivers of innovation which are kind of fundamental to the way we live our lives. And, and how organizations engage with some of these topics is, is actually an important question. Because it's very easy to say they're too big, they're over there, we, we, sh we shouldn't care about them. And I'd like to take you to another example here, which is Corning. How many of you are familiar with Corning as a company? Corning, yeah, what do you know about Corning? Um, they're developed this multi-touch Displays, displays, yes. Yeah. So Corning, did you know anything about the history of Corning? Maybe, maybe you, you know something about the history of Corning. Oh, Corning. Um, I don't know anything about the history, but I know them as part of the Dow Corning group. Right, okay. With the chemicals and the glass. Yeah. Combination yeah. Of yeah. yeah, okay. Anybody else know about Corning? I was going to say the same. It's chemicals, yeah. insulation, glass, plastics. So let's go back and look at where, how did Corning suddenly become relevant in the world in general? And it's the time of Edison. When Edison created the first um, light in the form of, of, of uh, heating up a filament, he needed a glass manufacturer that could make strong light bulb structures that he could use to create his light bulbs from. And that's where Corning came in. So Corning worked with Edison, and the first set of light bulbs that were, were used in the US and, and then globally came from Corning. And that's how they really started in, in, the, in, in becoming a global player. They then started to innovate glass, and they continued to innovate glass to the point where they became the dominant maker of uh, displays for LCD screens. Most of you with an LCD screen there will have Gorilla Glass, which is manufactured by Corning. Right? It's very clear, strong glass. It comes from this company in New York. I say Dow, Dow Corning, right? But how does somebody like Corning, who just manufactured glass, engage with uh, the, the ecosystem of partners? And the way they do that is to create a video. So back actually two years ago, they created a video called Day in Glass. You've probably seen this video. Yeah. So let's have a look at the video.
The point of the video is glass is just a piece of glass and yet they started to portray the issues that matter to individuals to drive innovation in the use of glass and how you engage in the ecosystem to work with you in taking your glass and applying it in different ways is what they're trying to do. And this is kind of fundamental to what's happening with innovation and there are really two barriers I see to innovation. Right, one barrier is organizations get very comfortable with where they are today. They get very cozy and they, and they sit in this nice comfy chair and it's, it's, it's fine. And, and then innovation out there is, is a fog. It's kind of hard for them to really see that. They say that there's, there's something there, but, but the journey from where they are to that innovation just is too foggy. So the challenge that you all face in the marketplace of driving innovation is 
how do you create a little, little bit of discomfort to understand what the challenges are there? And then how do you start to make some clarity of the fog so that people will come with you on that journey? Right? And that's the innovation and the challenge that you all face in, in the marketplace. So I want to finish with a, with, a, with a story because you've got to understand how the world is changing. And the expectations are changing in ways that we hadn't really understood. So I'm going to give you a, a, a personal story. Right? So I have two children, a boy and a girl. And uh, I have to travel extensively in my job. So I'm often away from home. And I took the decision that I would phone home at 7 p.m. UK time, wherever I was. In my diary, my assistant fenced off 30 minutes for me to phone home. And the phone call went something along the lines of this. So, so from the age of two, which yeah, you'll, you'll know, um, I'd, I'd phone home. And my wife would give the, the phone to my, the kids because she knew I was phoning. And I'd, the conversation went along the lines of, um, how's your day been? Fine. What did you do today? Nothing. How was school? Fine. Shall I give it to mum? Right. That was the net of the conversation. Right? And, and we did this. This ritual went on for many, many years until, until the age of 11. And what changed was my son got his first uh, smartphone. It was an Android phone, actually. Right? And uh, we were very um, protectionist as parents, and they weren't allowed Facebook. Right? You're not allowed Facebook until you're 18, or actually 16. Um, so my son got to Twitter, right? and he started tweeting. Right? And, and the only guidance I gave him for Twitter was, um, if you're comfortable seeing that tweet to be to, uh, shown on BBC News that evening, it's fine to say on Twitter. That was the only guidance he got. Very simple, right? And, um, <coughs> and, and so, you know, our, our phone call at 7 p.m. suddenly changed because he was watching me on Twitter and I was watching him, right? So, so he'd say, you know, uh, came out of English, hated English, don't know what we're doing, uh, or maths, we're doing this maths, a really cool maths lesson, uh, playing football, Joe kicked me, hey, Joe. You know, it's kind of kids kind of thing. But the conversation wasn't how was your day? The conversation was... What was it in English? And, and all of a sudden, I had a much deeper conversation with him. So our worlds were getting connected because he was leaving breadcrumbs in Twitter of his day, and I was leaving my breadcrumbs, and we could start to connect together. So that, that kind of changes the expectations of, of, of how we live our lives. But what became really interesting was when we went on holiday. Um, we were going to Portugal. Um, and uh, on the particular flight, as we got onto the plane, uh, somebody had been sick, right? So you can imagine how you know the smell kind of stays there; it doesn't go, right? And uh, my son says, "Dad, it stinks here. Do you have to see?" It? I said, "Yes, we do." You know, I tried to move, but we couldn't move, so we had to stay on this particular seat. Anyway, it's one of these um, one of these planes where the pilot's a um, um, a commercial pilot, and he likes the vertical takeoffs and vertical landings. You, you may have seen them; right? they suddenly come down and sort of almost bounce down, right? And and um, my son has. Uh, a problem with ear infections. And at that particular moment, he had an ear infection. So as the plane comes to land, it's incredibly painful. Right? And, and you could see the pain on his face. So we've given him your know, ear pugs and chewing gum, but nothing helps, right? But he's 13 and he's not gonna cry. So he's, you know, he's very, very, you know. So the first thing he does, is gets off the plane and he tweets, flew airline A, smelly plane, horrible landing, wish would have gone airline B, you know, bang. Tweet to the world, right? Now, what was interesting was, an hour later, airline A responds and says, sorry about the poor customers, customer services, um, call us on this number. Right? My son comes bounding like, Dad, Dad, look at this, look at this, look at this. <laughs> um, and uh, and said, so, yeah, do you want to phone them? He said, no, that's no, fine. Okay, so. um, what was more interesting was, about 10 minutes later, airline B responds and says, thanks for the positive quote, look forward to seeing you next year. Right? Right? Right. Now, I happen to know the CIO of Airline A and the CIO of Airline B. So I pick up the phone and said, this is what's just happened. And the CIO of Airline A says, we've just had this software on trial from this Irish software house, and it's really cool, automated Twitter analytics, and great responses, nice story, I'll tell the team, thank you. Airline B. We've got the software from this Irish software house. It's on trial. 
it does Twitter analytics, but we decided instead of giving an automated response, we would queue the response to the call center and the call centers would give a personalized response. Right. Two different strategies, same software, two different strategies, very interesting the response. But the point of the story is, the expectation now is, if my son's going for his birthday party and he tweets that it's his birthday and there isn't a cake waiting there for him, he gets upset. Right? That's the expectation. The expectation is that the service that's provided is personalized to me. Right? If I've told you this is what I want and you don't do it, that's your problem. I will not be happy. But that is the expectation. And, and, and the technology allows us to do more and more of this. So the personalization of our services is one of the fundamental drivers of value going forward. So, so I'm gonna close off and, and just sort of remind you of, of uh, Walt Disney's quote, which is, really it's about our dreams. We can make a lot of these things possible. Innovation is about helping us make those dreams come to life. Thank you.